and we are out of time, so thanks for coming to tonight's show. Uh, no, okay, so we're going to go straight into, uh, I was the zeroth act of the second half. Yeah, I'm okay with that. Uh, and uh, let's, I'm going to go back to fading, because I think that, um, we're now going to bring on your, your first act of uh, the second half. Uh, who, uh, so, uh, is, is a practicing, is a practicing medical professional. You know, so, like me, adds a lot to society. Um, and not, not like practicing as in like, still giving it a go, right? Like, well, they're probably still getting better. Uh, I don't know why I thought I'd include malpractice implications in my introduction, but uh, if you would kindly ignore all of that, please welcome to the stage, Rowan Francis! <laughs> Isn't the human body amazing? <laughs> billions and billions of cells. The wonder of DNA. The miracle of you. No, no, take it from me, people. The human body is an absolute mess. All of you here today, C minus at best, could definitely do a lot better. Something happened recently. It happens every year, actually. Uh, the latest generation of sacrificial morons um, did something particularly idiotic. They gained a place at medical school to become doctors. Something I did two decades ago and have been regretting it ever since. And at the interview, they always ask a question, why do you want to do medicine? And people trot out the same unimaginative drivel every time. Two reasons. Number one, I want to help people. Number two, because I'm fascinated by the amazing human body. Now, I think anyone who knows me could have told you that the first one never really applied. But the second one I've also been, been learning is complete lies. Because the human body is a collection of all kinds of mistakes. And if I was going to tell you all of them, would be here for days. So I'm just going to give you a little sample today in a segment that I like to call parts of the body that are dicks, <laughs> but aren't actually dicks. Well, while we're on the subject of small appendages, why don't we start with the, the most famous one that is probably responsible for more death and illness than any other apparently redundant little pocket of tissue. You know what I'm talking about. Of course, it's the left atrial appendage. <laughs> well, you thought I was going to say the appendix. <laughs> I mean, the appendix gets all the headlines, but frankly is a rank amateur when it comes to the fine art of doing harm to its owner compared to the left atrial appendage. I mean... I'm not saying the appendix is innocent, it's clearly a dick. I mean, imagine this coming at you in a dark alley outside the Bloomsbury <laughs> Theatre. But it, it really is an amateur compared to the left atrial appendage. Uh, because appendicitis these days, you know, it's rarely fatal, it's easily treated. Often we don't even need to do surgery anymore. But the left atrial appendage uh, is responsible for one quarter of all strokes. So its impact is much bigger. And it does this by, it's a little finger-like structure coming off the left atrium in the heart rather than anything to do with the bowel. And if people go into an irregular heart rhythm, which is quite common as we get older, blood inside the left atrial appendage kind of starts acting a bit like a, a teenager. It sort of sits around doing sod all for a while, solidifies into a blood clot, and then one day says, Mum, I want to go and see the world. I've heard about this fantastic tourist attraction that I really want to see called the brain. And it packs its bags, heads out the door, and before you know it, you're paralysed down your left side. <laughs> and cardiologists like me, we like to talk about the appendage, we obsess over it, we talk about its crenellations, its lobes, its orifice, and we classify it, and these are all real classifications, uh, into cauliflower, <laughs> cactus, windsock, <laughs> and chicken wing. <laughs> We'd probably get more excited about the appendage than, than anybody else does about any appendage. Whereas the appendix probably gets a bit of a bad rap because the appendix, we think, actually has a role in repopulating the microbiome of the bowel, if you believe in such conspiracy theories. And uh, so if you get a diarrheal illness, which obviously humans have done throughout our history, 
Um, in the past, I guess it would have typically been due to unsanitary conditions, contaminated water. Nowadays, probably more likely a TikTok laxative challenge. <laughs> and this can uh, deplete the bowel of its bacteria. And we think that the appendix acts like a reservoir of good bacteria, good guy appendix repopulating the bowel. But the left atrial appendage doesn't seem to have any function that we know of at all. So I think it's far worse. And if you're getting confused that the human body has quite a few appendages, both inside and out, but only one appendix, just remember it has to come from the cecal region of the bowel to be called an appendix, otherwise it is just a sparkling protuberance. <laughs> colds. I mean, humans get colds a lot more than other animals, as you've probably noticed. And while we share a lot of our shortcomings with our primate cousins, this is one area where we're quite unique because our facial bones are pretty different. And this occurred over evolution, if you believe in that conspiracy theory. And um, the, our brains got bigger, we became less dependent on our sense of smell, and this had a catastrophic effect on the drainage configuration of our sinuses. Plus, they look terrifying. Uh, I didn't really notice, but I think that's Mark Zuckerberg's sinuses. But, um, <laughs> So the, the sinuses up here drain using a phenomenon that I'm pretty sure has been present for the majority of human evolution, which is gravity. And, but the maxillary sinuses here, which are the biggest, the biggest snot capacity, decided I'm going to be, we're going to be different. We're going to drain upwards. So we are effectively the apple mouse of uh, <laughs> na nasal st structures. And, I mean, maybe that's not the most apt allergy because, uh, analogy, because you might think we're a bit more like a little teapot. If you tip yourself up, you can pour yourself out. But the problem is, with the way that uh, the sinuses are arranged, if you tip one side, it's just going to fill the other. And even if you stand on your head, it'll fill the, the sinuses at the top. So, in effect, you're just trapped in a never-ending cycle of snot redistribution. <laughs> so, we're more like a, a lava lamp. <laughs> There are lots of other shortcomings I'm sure you've heard of. I'll just whiz through a few. Our backs are basically made from baguettes and discarded pogs. <laughs> Our knees are held together with uh, an elastic band from Sainsbury's deli counter. <laughs> Our heads are famously too big for our mother's pelvises, meaning that hundreds of thousands of humans through history's first act has been matricide, which is particularly <laughs> Particularly foolish when you think about mammals, very defining feature being what mothers do after giving birth. So this is quite a spectacular fail. And, of course, our wrists and ankles are a complete bodge of <laughs> dried pieces of toast crust and a, a handful of Lego people. Well, probably not a handful, because the hand hadn't fully evolved yet. But irrespective of all of these problems, can probably go under the subheading of bipedalism, which I think we can all agree was a mistake. <laughs> now, a lot of people hold up these shortcomings as evidence that there's no creator, that uh, there's nothing intelligent about this design. But have any of you rampant evolutionists ever stopped to consider that maybe there is a god? <laughs> and he's just a complete moron. Thanks very much.